All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening to you. It is Thursday. We're going to talk about the week ahead, uh, about the week that just happened. It's late. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but uh, thanks for joining. If you are on Facebook, this should be streaming live for the first time. We're also streaming live on Twitch. I don't know how that works. Maybe someone there sees this. Oh, uh, and we're also on YouTube. You can make sure that if you, uh, you know, the drill, you can support the channel by going here. You can also uh, ask questions throughout the episode. We have a uh, Den who is helping out with moderation. He's going to flag any questions, super likes, things like that. So we can answer those later. And uh, so many stories I want to get to today. So I'm going to start off by talking about uh, a multi-year lawsuit that was just resolved this week. And basically this involves the question of whether or not it's legal to teach Islam in a public school. Uh, what a judge said this week, getting to the heart of the matter, is that no, that is not a constitutional violation. And I think that should seem obvious. And yet this took like six years to resolve and I want to kind of go through that history because it's kind of messed up how that happened. Basically, this whole story revolves around a middle school in New Jersey where they were teaching seventh graders a required class. It's called World Cultures and Geography. And basically, the idea here is, hey, middle school kids, there's a lot of different parts of the world you may not be familiar with. We're going to introduce you to where in the world we are talking about what the culture is like there, what are the religious beliefs of the people who typically live there, things like that. So yeah, that's what you should learn around that age. Fine. One of the units in that course covered the Middle East and North Africa. We're going to talk about the culture there and the people who live there. That seems like an appropriate place to bring up Islam and what the basic beliefs of Islam are for the people in America, for the middle schoolers who don't know anything about it. So here's the thing. I'm going to share this with you in a second. In 2017, 2017, there were a couple of parents who showed up to a school board meeting, and basically they started complaining about all this. Let me show this to you here. Um, look at the uh, date on this article. February 7th, 2017. And as we're looking at this article, uh, two things you got to know. One is that one parent complained that they were teaching uh, Islam in the classroom because check this out. One parent uh, talked about how her name is Nancy Gayer. She said her son was not allowed to show his PowerPoints to the class because it was proselytizing. She compared it to the world cultures and geography class her son is taking at the middle school, which she believes is outright proselytizing in violation of district policy. Like, do we really need to talk about why those are apples and oranges at this point? Her son wanted to proselytize during some class presentation, and I guess the teacher said no. And then the teachers were teaching kids about Islam, like the very basic beliefs of it. And this mother thought those were comparable somehow. So that's messed up on one end, but then it got worse. And the next parent is the one uh, worth keeping an eye on here because she's the one who ultimately filed the lawsuit. This other uh, mother that got involved here, her name is uh, Libby Hilsenrath, as you can see here. And she handed out material, which has been emailed to the board and gave some details she felt crossed the line into proselytizing during a cartoon video shown to the students. And here's the thing. I'm not going to show you the video. I don't know what rights I have to show you the full video. But basically, let me describe the video for you. It's a five-minute animation of a Muslim kid and a non-Muslim kid. And basically, the non-Muslim kid is wondering what his buddy believes in. And the buddy says, oh, let me tell you the basic beliefs of Islam. So the kid goes through, like, these are the five pillars of Islam. It says, like, what do you believe, Muslim child? And the Muslim kid says, I believe there is no God except Allah. Yeah, I mean, that 
is a basic Islamic belief. What the mother said, uh, Libby Hilsenrath, what she said is that the video states that Allah is the maker of everything, the one true God, and the main character in the cartoon video is looking for converts, which is not how five-minute kids animation works. And so she was mad about the cartoon. He's not looking for converts, by the way. He's basically educating his friend who knows nothing about the religion. Uh, when the kid in the video says Muslims believe there is no God except Allah, yeah, that's accurate. That is what Muslims believe, which is why the Muslim character, fictional one, said it. So anyway, she also complained, the mother, she also complained about how that unit did not cover Christianity and Judaism, even though both of those religions are also in the Middle East and North Africa, which is true. But also, there are plenty of other places around the world where you could discuss Christianity and Judaism. And by the way, they do in this curriculum. But in that particular unit, they're not saying only Muslims live there. It's that, hey, this seems like an appropriate time to bring up these beliefs. So here's the thing. The school district is completely right because they, com they basically defended what they were doing. The superintendent said these lessons are aligned with the New Jersey Common Core curriculum. They covered many religions, not just one. But these mothers kept whining and whining and whining. And guess what happened after that? They decided to go on Tucker Carlson's show, those two mothers, to complain about what was being done. And guess how that played out? It's exactly as you would expect. Check this out. Things changed when those moms appeared on Tucker Carlson tonight. This is according uh, to, who is this again? This is the board president, the school board president of the district, Jill Weber. She said, Miss Libby Hilsenrath went on national television on February 20th, 2017, mind you, and made some patently false statements about the district. Specifically, that our curriculum crossed the line because it teaches one religion and not all others. Uh, another quote, no other religion is taught. That's what she said on Tucker Carlson. Not true. It was that last statement that caused dozens and dozens of hate mail, violent, vulgar mail to the district, violent threats against our employees, violent threats against our employees' families, death threats against our employees, physical harm to our buildings. And this went on for a while. One threat was so credible, the federal authorities had to get involved. So that's what these women were doing when they went on Tucker Carlson to spread lies because they're too dumb to understand what's happening in their own school district. And by the way, we saw this happening just this week while the Republicans in the U.S. House are trying to figure out who their next leader is. Jim Jordan, the ultra conservative MAGA cultist guy, when he realized he wasn't going to get the votes, that he needed, what did he do to like the 20 Republicans who didn't want to vote for him? Basically, he got his right wing allies to get their mobs in a frenzy and send death threats to those lawmakers, to their families, etc. And a bunch of those Republicans were not happy about it. I mean, to be clear, none of them cared when the same mobs went after liberals, but now they're coming after them and they're very surprised by this. Anyway, so that's what these women did. And then in 2018, Libby uh, Hilsenrath, one of those two mothers, decided to file a lawsuit. She filed a lawsuit against the district, basically saying everything uh, was indoctrination. She said they were trying to push Islam on kids, that they were trying to proselytize the students and, and get them to convert to Islam. And of course, none of that was true. There's one part in the press release to that lawsuit I want to bring up here. Um, this is the lawsuit from the Thomas More uh, Law Center. This is the right-wing legal group that did all this stuff. Check this out. This is why they were mad about the unit. Clearly, seventh graders were given a sugar-coated false depiction of Islam. They were not informed of the kidnappings, beheadings, slave tradings, massacres, and persecution of non-Muslims, nor of the repression of women all done in the name of Islam. That's what these people think seventh graders need to learn the first time they are being introduced to Islam. Not the five pillars, nothing about Mecca. No, no, no. They just need to be told that like ISIS or Islamic extremists 
take these beliefs and run with them and take them to these extreme, awful situations as if those extremists are representative of all Muslims. And if that's the argument you want to make about Islam, wait till I teach you all about Christianity, because you'll never believe what Christians throughout history have done in the name of their faith. Does that represent all Christians? No, of course not. If you were going to teach children about Christianity, what would you teach them? Probably something about who Jesus was and what Christians believe about Jesus. And you would not like mention, oh, by the way, the Crusades. You wouldn't bring that up on day two. No, you save that for later because that's clearly not the basis of the religion. But this is the lawsuit that they brought about. So this gets filed in 2018. And the question is, okay, so what happens to this lawsuit? What does a judge say? The good news is that in 2020 now, a judge finally ruled on this case. His name is Kevin McNulty. He's a U.S. federal judge. And he ruled on the case and said, what the hell is wrong with all of you? I'm paraphrasing here. He basically tossed out the lawsuit. But I do want to bring up one of the arguments he made for what was wrong with it. First of all, he said, all the things you brought up in the lawsuit, it's, there's no clear indication indoctrination is happening. For example, the school suggested that kids who were interested in learning more about the religion they could watch a video, a certain video, and they included the link, but it wasn't, re no one was required to watch it, and it was created by a Muslim organization, um, but it didn't matter because kids didn't have to watch it. They were not tested on it. There's no evidence that Hilsenrath's own son clicked that link or understood any of the, you know, deeper meaning of what he was watching. It was also obvious to the judge that any reasonable person would know the school is not forcing kids to adopt these views. They were just offering them up as examples of what Muslims believe. For example, there was a worksheet kids had to do that they had to complete where they had to fill in the blanks about basic Islamic beliefs. For example, there is no God but blank and blank is his messenger. You should know that the answers are Allah and Muhammad. That's a question of whether you understand basic Muslim theology. There, there's no demand there that everyone agree with it. You know what I mean? So he dismissed the case. But I want, to, I want you to look at one specific thing. Look at how he writes this. Finally, I turn to the underlying merits, uh, whether the challenge materials and curriculum violate the Establishment Clause. I rule that they do not. Good. Fine. That is correct. But look at this. Uh, what he points to, in many respects, the Establishment Clause test is in flux. The default test has long been that of Lemon v. Kurtzman. Let's talk about that for a second. That bears a mention here because this is important. The Lemon test has was in fact for several decades as a way for judges to figure out if some law violated the Constitution because it was endorsing religion. The Lemon test basically says, Let's just ask three questions. Does the law in question have a secular purpose? If it does, should be fine. Is the law trying to advance or inhibit religion? If the answer is no, we are fine. And finally, is there excessive entanglement between church and state as a result of the law? If the answer is no, we're fine. So basically, that's the lemon test. And it's basically the Supreme Court saying you can use this test. And if any one of those three things fail, well, then you could say it's illegal. But if it passes the test, then you can't say it's a violation, separation of church and state or anything like that. So this judge looked at what the lawsuit was. Like, what's the curriculum here when it comes to what we are teaching kids about Islam? Or is it a secular curriculum? The answer is yes. Um, is it advancing religion or inhibiting religion? Obviously, no. Is it entangling church and state? No. So the judge basically says there's no entanglement here. The curriculum passes the lemon test. We're okay. I'm dismissing this case. And that, of course, is the right conclusion. The district said this is a complete vindication of the board, the district administration, and the teachers. So why are we still talking about this? Because all that happened in 2020. Well, 
if you are familiar with the Bremerton case that the Supreme Court heard last year, the one where that high school football coach wanted to pray at midfield after football games, one of the things that the coach argued, uh, that the justices argued when they were discussing that case, is that we're not going to use the lemon test anymore. Conservative judges hate the lemon test. They've been trying to get rid of it forever. And long story short, the Bremerton case, one of the legal issues that was discussed in the rulings is that the lemon test is dead. You can't use it as justification for why something can or cannot be done. So the Thomas More Law Center, this mother, uh, Hilsenrath, they appealed the case and they said, you guys, this judge who ruled against us said, oh, well, let me use the lemon test and uh, I'm dismissing the case. Well, he can't do that. So a higher court said, all right, we're, evic we're vacating the ruling and we're going to send this case back to that judge and say, do it again, rule based, because you can't use that tool anymore. Can't use the lemon test. Do you got a better reason that this curriculum is legal or illegal? So this goes back to the judge. And now this week, he finally ruled again. It's been years. The kid at the center of this controversy, Hilsenrath's son, I'm pretty sure he's like graduating high school. But check out what the judge said this time around. While clearly rejecting the lemon test, uh, the question is, what is going to replace it? And here's the part I want you to look at. He says the most prominent of those markers is the majority's emphasis on the presence or not of coercion. What he's saying is that, <laughs> excuse me, what he's saying is that if I can't use the lemon test anymore, the right-wing conservative Supreme Court that currently sits on the bench, they say the better test is we're the, we're the educators trying to coerce kids into doing something religious against their will. So we could say, were they trying to force Islam on students against their will? And this time, the judge goes through the inner case and, and says, well, guess what? No. They weren't. Of course, they were not trying to coerce anybody. He said, I find the record contains no evidence of significant coercion. He goes through all the things those religious lawyers mentioned, and he says direct subjective evidence of coercion is lacking. And he also says, if you want me to look at like what the founding fathers would have said, there's nothing in the curriculum that bears or resembles the hallmarks of religious establishments the framers sought to prohibit when they adopted the First Amendment. So even using conservative Christian Supreme Court rules to apply them to this case, the judge said again, it's still fine. This woman is crazy. And he dismisses the case again. It's like he finally said after six years what every single person except right-wing Christians, and this mother knew several years ago that teaching kids about other religions is not indoctrination. I will say, I emailed the Thomas More Law Center, and I was like, hey, guys, you don't, uh, you don't have any press releases on your site about the fact that you lost. What do you think? What do you think about the fact that the judge thinks you're all idiots? I, I wrote a better email than that. They did not respond to me, and they still haven't issued any response to this case. And I don't know if they're going to try to appeal it again. At this point, I don't know what grounds they would use to appeal it, because again, the, the woman's son is graduating. It's hard to imagine he's been scarred for life as a result of having to learn about Islam for three days back in seventh grade. So it's the right ending, but it shows you not just how crazy some right-wing Christians are when it comes to kids learning about something that, I don't know, might steer them away from Christianity, but also the legal tactics they are trying to use to make sure no one can learn about it. But again, even if the right-wing Supreme Court is trying to destroy church-state separation, the Constitution still exists. The Establishment Clause and the First Amendment still exists. There are still ways to tell people whether something is religious indoctrination, whether it's illegal, or whether, no, it's totally fine. No one's trying to indoctrinate your kid. No one thinks about your kid like that. So good, good answer, good ending to this story. I'm going to get some water. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them.
My junior high also taught Christian Genesis alongside evolution. That's that's weird. Public school in the early 80s. Well, if it's in the early 80s, maybe they could get away with that. I don't think schools could get away with that anymore. Um, because unless you're talking about mythology or what various groups do to teach mythology, like this is what uh, the Greeks felt was the creation of the world. This is what different religions say. Then you could bring up creationism, I guess. I'm not sure uh, why they would do it alongside evolution because those things are not on the same playing field. But again, if it was 40 years ago, I, I guess that could have happened. <laughs> the current strategy of conservative evangelicals seem to be seems to be to throw legal crap against the wall and see what sticks. I, I think you're right. Yeah, they're they're doing they're trying to bring cases to the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court can rule in their favor for, even if those cases would never see the light of day if you had smarter people on the court. And they're trying to I mean, it's scary right now for church state separation people, for civil rights advocates, because it's just playing defense right now. Uh, they don't want to bring cases to the court. They're just trying to stop the bad ones from having, you know, from wreaking havoc onto the system. It is scary. Uh, all right. I'm going to go. Let me jump. Oh, oh, you're going to enjoy this one. Okay. Let's talk about Stephanie Borowitz. She is a, a member of Pennsylvania's state house. Uh, she's a Christian nationalist who has been in office for a few years now. And recently, uh, this week, she decided to fight against a climate change bill. And I'm going to play a clip for you. I want to show you what she said, and then we're going to talk about why she said it. But basically, uh, there was a billing question. She had to vote on it. And here is how she argued that this bill, uh, which addresses climate change, was garbage. Here's the clip. Uh, when Democrats are pushing bills like banning gas-powered mowers and gas-powered stoves in New York City, all under the name of a climate control agenda, we can all see what is really going on here. The truth is, is in Genesis 8.22, it says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. I'll say that again, will never cease. Of course, we are to be good stewards of God's creation, but not through a forceful climate control global agenda. I'm a no. Thank you, Chairman. So I saw that and I'm thinking, what the hell did she just say no to? Because I saw that video and I saw that this woman cited Genesis 8 as reason climate change doesn't exist. Because apparently God said, you know, circa 2000 years ago or something, that the earth, as long as the earth endures, we'll have seasons. So we're fine. I guess we're not going to burn up or something like that. Uh, and then she refers to a forceful climate control global agenda. So it's like, okay, what was this bill about? Are they trying to force everyone to buy electric cars by like tomorrow? And she's like, how dare you? You can't do that. So I looked it up and let me show you what this is all in reference to. House Resolution 228. I'll, I'll make this larger here. Um, and this is basically... I'll show you what it is in a second, but just look at some of these whereas clauses. Whereas climate change is real and human-made, and the impact of climate change jeopardize both the environment and the current and future health and well-being of the residents of Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's what climate change does. That's accurate. Uh, what else does this say? Uh, that the consequences of an action on the climate crisis will be severe and potentially irreversible. That is also accurate. Uh, yeah, if we... Do climate policy and legislation that protect our environment. We're going to create new jobs, safe communities, a better economy. That's also accurate. Okay. What are they talking about? This right here resolved that the House of Representatives designate the week of October 1st through 7th, 2023 as Climate Week. That's it. By the way, this took place earlier this week. They were voting to retroactively say that the first week of October is climate week. And that's it. There's no 
consequences. There's no law being passed here. Nothing changes. They're just saying, hey, you know that week we had a couple of weeks ago? Can we just call that Climate Week and raise awareness about climate change? And this woman, Stephanie Borowitz, was like, how dare you? God said climate change isn't real. And so I vote no on this symbolic resolution that carries zero weight. That's what she was talking about. And she called it a forceful climate control global agenda. That resolution that has no teeth. But here's the thing. I know this all sounds batshit crazy. But as I mentioned, I think it might have been last week. Uh, this is par for the course for evangelical Christians. This was a chart I think I showed last week. When it comes to climate change and what percent of Americans say climate change is a crisis, look at the uh, blue dots on this chart I am showing you here. Because uh, if you scroll down to white evangelical Protestants, you could see they are at 8%. And that's even lower than the 13% they were at a decade ago. Only 8% of white evangelicals accept the climate crisis and actually think man contributes to it. And Stephanie Borowitz is one of them. And in case you're wondering, like, have you ever heard of this person? Maybe you haven't. Uh, this is someone who's been doing this sort of thing for years. And one example of that, um, a couple years ago in uh, 2019, it was the first time a Muslim woman was sworn into office in Pennsylvania as the state's first Muslim legislator. Well, it also turned out that Stephanie Borowitz was able to deliver the invocation that morning, and she decided to give an invocation. Uh, I'm going to show you a bit of the transcript here. Thank you, Speaker. Let us pray. Jesus, I thank you. Yada, yada, yada. Just look at all the Jesus in this speech. It's like 13 times, and she rushed through it in like 90 seconds, basically throwing Jesus against the wall as much as possible, I guess to counteract the fact that now there was a Muslim in the chamber. Like that Muslim lawmaker's family was in the crowd, and they had to listen to this woman like yell Jesus at them a whole bunch. That's one thing she's done in the past. And I know even that's symbolic. It just shows you the sort of person she is. But it goes beyond that, too. Uh, she has also uh, called COVID, quote, a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins. She has been peddling fake cures for COVID that aren't real. Uh, this is another thing she has done. Check this out. Uh, last year, Representative Borowitz introduced a don't say gay bill. While bragging, it goes even further than Florida GOP Governor Ron DeSantis's bill did. She also called for the Secretary of Education to resign because LGBTQ inclusive curricula and other resources were featured on the State Department of Education site. Like, she can't handle being around people who don't share her views. That's like the theme of her life. In case you were wondering, she sits in a very comfortably red seat in her house district. She won in 2022. She was reelected in 2022 with about 67% of the votes. That's an easy victory for her. And Democrats in Pennsylvania, the good news there is Democrats in the state house in Pennsylvania have a one vote majority. So technically the Democrats are ahead there and the governor is a Democrat as well. Uh, Republicans, however, control the state Senate. So in terms of lawmaking, Stephanie Borowitz, thankfully, doesn't get to call the shots. But it, this sort of thing, it does tell you the sort of Republicans they elect. I mean, everywhere, but certainly in Pennsylvania, too. So uh, just a messed up story where a lawmaker who ought to know better and is in a position to decide not just resolutions, but what laws pass, is saying climate change isn't real because someone speaking for God said so in the way she interprets the Bible because she doesn't know how to interpret things or how science works. And that's an elected lawmaker for you. All right. What questions we got here? Brings a whole new meaning to the whole on fire for Jesus thing. No kidding. Because of evangelical Christians, we are ever so closer to 
having the planet basically be on fire. We're all going to be on fire soon. You're welcome. Yeah, it's messed up. Some people just want to watch the world burn. They are Christians. They are eager to bring on Armageddon. Unfortunately, I agree with you. By the way, if you go to Kickstarter right now, I am doing a fundraiser for a, a series I'm going to do soon about the book of Revelation, which is about Armageddon and why Christians, some of them, are so eager for that day to come. Uh, it is thankfully funded, uh, but it's still going for another three weeks because it's a 30-day fundraiser. So if you like it, you can go there and chip in. I would appreciate it. Anything else? Gize. Is that the plural? Is that the right plural? I like that. I'm going to spell that wrong, but I like it. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's go to what other... Oh, okay. Let's talk about this story right here. I'm going to show you a law. Since we're in Pennsylvania, I'm going to stick, pen stick to Pennsylvania. I'm going to show you a law that actually exists in Pennsylvania. And we're going to read it together because this law is very real. Um, doesn't matter what number it is, but it involves fortune telling. And check this out. A person is guilty of a misdemeanor of the third degree if he pretends for gain or lucre, basically for money, to tell fortunes or predict future events by cards, tokens, inspecting hands, whatever. Basically, if you are making money, by predicting the future, however you want to do it, it's illegal in Pennsylvania. That's a real law that exists there. And here's the thing, a third degree misdemeanor, that means if you were found guilty of that, you could go to prison for up to a year. You may have to pay a $2,500 fine. This law has been on the books since 1861. I don't believe I found evidence of anyone being prosecuted under it since 1935. So it's one of those archaic laws. It's really hard if you're a lawmaker to try to get rid of a law that's already on the books. So a lot of times you have these vestigial laws that were there at some point, maybe for some reason in the past. They're there because no one cares enough to get rid of it. It's just not worth the time and energy. Uh, but more importantly, it's not like anyone is prosecuting this stuff, right? That's the idea. Well, in Pennsylvania, and by the way, this law kind of makes sense. If It's basically saying if you're a con artist lying to people about, oh, I can predict the future and you're stealing their money while offering a lie, we want to punish that. I kind of get that. Uh, I think there's something to be said about that. But okay, what happened this week is that a uh, shop owner, the, her, uh, their name is Beck Lawrence. I'm going to show you this. This is a uh, this is a article that appeared in a local publication, like a chamber of commerce sort of thing. Meet Beck, and what you could see here is they say this is Beck Lawrence. They just opened the Serpent's Key Shop and Sanctuary, and one of the things that is sold in this establishment are tarot card readings. And so, once this article became public and it went out to the community. I mean, most people would just ignore it. Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's not. Um, what happened is that apparently a cop saw that, the chief of police in that area saw that, and decided to go to the shop. Not to arrest Beck Lawrence. He dropped by the store to let them know the law exists. And Beck Lawrence was frustrated by all this, especially since there are disclaimers in the shop that tarot readings are just for fun. Uh, Lawrence said in an article, the visit was intimidating because it was the chief of police and some other cop. So yeah, I can see why that would be intimidating. And Lawrence said, he didn't give me any advice or anything. The message was, hey, just so you know, this is the law. And the thing is though, what the cop didn't understand is that tarot readings are not the same as psychic predictions or someone with a crystal ball who's charging you money. Basically, tarot is help is there to help clarify thoughts that are already in your head. It's it helps you clarify your decision making process. I'm not necessarily defending tarot readings. I think it's all BS anyway. 
but it's not predicting the future. What Lauren said is that tarot readings are meant to help a person by giving clarity about their path in life. They do not tell a person what is in store for them, such as whether they will win money or reveal the whereabouts of missing loved ones. Quote, I pull my cards and study the symbols. My job is to string these things together of what I'm seeing. It is up to their free will. There is nothing set in stone. I am 26. I don't know the answers, which is a great response. Uh, by the way, you know who else gives people clarity about their path in life while acknowledging the customer has free will to do what they want, but also takes your money in exchange? Doctors, lawyers, police officers who give unsolicited advice. So all of this is absurd because, again, Lawrence is not trying to dupe anybody with lofty promises. Like if a customer finds value in tarot readings, that should be the end of the matter. Like it's not what I would spend my money on. But in terms of frivolous entertainment, I mean, there are plenty of ways people waste their money that I don't necessarily agree with, but whatever, it's their money. They can do what they want. Like the lottery, people play the lottery all the time. The odds of you winning the lottery, like Mega Millions, is slim to none. You're not going to do it. It's a waste of your money every time. But that's way more harmful than a tarot reading, which is also taking your money and then saying, mm, let's talk about the things that you're thinking about and try to help give you some guidance, right? I think bottom line is Lawrence is offering an experience, not a promise. You know what I mean? So the question is, what is the cop then warning them about? Um, Lawrence also mentioned on TikTok, there are other metaphysical stores in the area. It's not clear why theirs was the one that was targeted. And I listen, even if you give the cops the benefit of the doubt here, I don't think they were trying to scare them on purpose. But the cop did make clear that, you know, if someone complains about this stuff, they absolutely will go after it. Check this out. This is a Facebook post the police department made earlier this month, Hanover Borough Police Department. The purpose of the law, uh, the following message is to respond to all the social media attention when Beck Lawrence started posting about this. Look at this. Upon observing an advertisement for a business in Hanover that offered tarot card readings, this is the chief of police here, I engaged in a conversation with two individuals concerning the ad and my intent to educate the person or persons engaged in the acts about the above listed statute. Basically saying, oh, they do tarot readings? Well, I came to talk to them about tarot readings. There was never an investigation, nor was there any threat of arrest in the matter. With that being said, there's our pivot. If a complaint was made against someone for engaging in acts qualifying as fortune telling in Hanover, this department would be obligated to conduct an investigation. That's a weird way to say, hey, guys, if you don't like what's going on at this shop, wink, wink, Christians, uh, you could go there and ask for a tarot reading and then come right back to me and I will pursue it. That's kind of what he's getting at. Finally, regarding this issue, the only department, I don't care about their department time. Um, if one possesses the sentiment that the law does not protect anyone from harm and is not needed, I would suggest they should contact their legislators and voice their opinion. So that's what the cops said in response to all the bad publicity they were getting. And their response is, well, we didn't do anything wrong. We will absolutely investigate, wink, wink if someone complains to us about the tarot readings, which no wonder Beck Lawrence is terrified. Like that's a scary thing for the chief of police to tell you, right? So that is frightening. I don't know what Beck Lawrence is supposed to do other than increase the font size of every sign that says for entertainment purposes only, or have clients sign paperwork saying, yeah, I know this isn't fortune telling before they get a tarot reading, which if, if that sounds dumb, that's like forcing a magician to begin every show by saying, everyone, everything you're about to see here is fake. I'm doing a bunch of tricks. So, you know, don't take it seriously. No, you're basically ruining the suspension of disbelief. Let me believe it. That's the fun I get. You know what I mean? Uh, but that's what the cop wants Beck Lawrence to do. And the irony in all this is that plenty of church leaders literally claim to predict the future based off of what the Bible says. 
except they call it prophecy instead of entertainment. And they don't say it's for entertainment purposes only. They take in money from people who believe the lie. I would argue it's even more harmful. It's also harmful when they call it faith healing. And yet no cop has ever gone to a Pennsylvania church telling pastors they could be prosecuted under the same law about conning people by pretending to offer them something they can't possibly offer. Right? So that's messed up. Uh, right now, the only change Lawrence is making to the store, uh, I enjoyed this. Lawrence is selling, uh, where did it go? Here we go. Lawrence is now selling these stickers. Pre-order, legalize Pennsylvania fortune telling. Uh, cute sticker. Anyone who wants it can pre-order it from the shop. I enjoyed that. By the way, even the local York Dispatch newspaper published an editorial this week basically calling for the police to lay off on these personal warnings when it comes to stupid laws and reminding everybody there's a massive difference between someone like Lawrence who openly provides entertainment and a con artist who perpetuates a lie. The editorial said the law is clearly outdated and if not taken off the books altogether, at least needs revising. So state lawmakers should ought to act. In the meantime, Personal warnings when no complaints have been filed should be kept to a minimum by Hanover authorities. And they also said, basically, this would be funny if it didn't occasionally conjure up unnecessary legal concerns. Um, by the way, I asked uh, Beck Lawrence what they were doing in response to the cop's threat, more or less. And Lawrence told me, uh, and I'm quoting here, in the future, I plan on instituting a waiver to ensure that there was a record of informed consent from each of the clients who come in to see me. So they all have to sign paperwork for a tarot card reading. Um, that said, Lawrence added that the feedback they've gotten has been overwhelmingly positive. Everyone's been super nice about all this. I hope business is going well, uh, but it's a scary situation over something that is silly and everyone knows is it's not predicting the future. So. Hope it goes well. Uh, what other questions we got here? <coughs> Canada still has witchcraft provisions in the criminal code. I believe that. I don't know where, but like, I think there are some states that have it too. And again, these are the laws that were written and drafted and enacted maybe a hundred, maybe more years ago. And again, it is so hard to get bad laws off the books. What you hope is like, okay, it's unenforceable. I'm sure a lot of you know, there are like seven states that have laws in the state books saying atheists can't run for public office. None of them are enforceable, but they exist on the books. Why? Because it's so much work to try to get a law out of the books. It's just easier to keep them there and say, yeah, it doesn't count anymore. There are other laws that supersede it, but it that leads to state law books that just are full of BS things in there. And the scary thing is, as we found out with the overturning of Roe, sometimes those old laws can be brought back if, you know, people decide, yeah, we like what they were doing in the 1700s. Let's bring that back and drown the witches, whatever. So it, it could be scary. What else? <laughs> I bet they didn't see that one coming. Well played, MW. Yes. Yes, Edmund. Well, how uh, how comes when uh, yeah how come when they do divination and prophecy? I assume you're talking about religious leaders. Yeah, when they do prophecy, it's fine. Even though I would argue they are lying to everybody and people are giving them money for doing it. Um, it shouldn't happen. But again, I'm not going to say it ought to be illegal. It's religion. That's how it works. But if you're going to punish a fortune teller or a psychic then shouldn't this fall under the same umbrella? Why not? False prophet, real prophet. Yes, agreed. Absolutely. I promise we're getting to good news stories in a little bit. There are a few of those. Uh, any other thoughts? Who would win in a fight, prophet of Zod or me? Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. I, I feel like I'm not allowed to answer this, but maybe uh, Den can run a poll or something. Uh, and figure out who's going to win in a fight. We could play that with a lot of... Oh, oh, Sod is streaming right now? Here's what you do. You open up this window and minimize it somewhere. 
and then you have the other one next to it and you decide who's worth watching and the answer is me that's how this works does prophet of zod have a room uh, yes prophet of zod doesn't have a room moderator there you go i agree all right someone uh says i see this in the comments add your twitch channel to your youtube about page i will i will try to remember that den's going to send me an email to do that uh because i literally turned on the twitch stuff this week and i still i don't even know if this is on twitch i'm told it is i don't know if anyone's watching it on twitch because i didn't tell anyone i was doing it but i don't know how the thing works so we'll figure it out okay i'm gonna get to the next story oh okay look i have a happy one for you you will enjoy this okay um let me make sure i have this up here okay uh, one of the things that gets really frustrating about the Democratic Party is that their base is full of non-religious voters. Like, we make up a good chunk of the Democratic voter base. It, just like conservative Christians, Catholics, all that make up a big chunk of the Republican voter base. And yet, we all know Republican candidates go above and beyond in making sure conservative Christians know that their voices are being heard, that, that if you elect a Republican, they will absolutely do whatever Jesus wants them to do. But Democrats don't touch atheists with like a 10-foot pole. They want nothing to do with us. They don't acknowledge us. They don't do... And you get why. For a long time, there was a stigma with the A word. But also, they don't really talk as much as I want them to about church-state separation, and they should. But... um. Over the past few years, that has slowly been changing, especially at higher levels. So in 2016, uh, or maybe 2012, there was like a faith outreach program by Barack Obama, um, but it didn't really involve atheists or anything. And in 2016, I don't think Hillary Clinton's campaign did any formal outreach to any secular groups. But in 2020, the Joe Biden campaign actually did invite like a group of humanists, and I was among them, to at least have a person from the Biden campaign staff hear our concerns on a regular basis and allow our like chosen leader for that group to take part in the interface discussions. Now, did anything result from that? Eh, not really. I think it was symbolic more than anything else, but that's good. They're not afraid of us. That's important. But check this out. Check out what happened uh, recently because. The Democratic National Committee met earlier this month at one of their gatherings and offering the benediction, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying we normally would have invited a pastor to deliver a prayer or something. They invited an atheist. They invited Sarah Levin, who is the founder of a group called Secular Strategies, which you can Google and look up. She's program director for the Secular Democrats of America. And like Jamie Harrison, the guy who's running the DNC, the former Senate candidate from South Carolina who now runs the party, he also introduced Sarah by letting everybody know she represents the secular community. She is on the DNC's Interfaith Council. She helped establish the first ever secular caucus in the Texas Democratic Party. And by the way, she helped pass like three policy resolutions that are now in the Texas Democratic Party's platform. She also got the uh, DNC nationally to pass a resolution in 2019 acknowledging the, quote, value, ethical soundness, and importance of non-religious Americans. Like, that's how Sarah was introduced, which is badass. That is amazing. And I just want to play two clips for you of what Sarah said in her uh, a short speech. She only had a few minutes. But here's the first clip. When a state bans abortion, it codifies a narrow set of religious beliefs that does not represent everyone and therefore violates the religious freedom of its citizens. Democrats have been on the front lines working to protect action, uh, access to abortion in the face of Republicans' relentless attacks on reproductive health care. And therefore, it is Democrats, not Republicans, that have been on the front lines defending religious freedom. I love that. Yes, we're the ones fighting for religious freedom. And you know that because for Democrats and progressives and the big tent of everyone who's not a mega cultist, 
like religious freedom involves people of all faiths and no faith. Like it's not just conservative Christians. So I love that she said that. I'm going to play one more clip from you and then I'll talk a little more. As Democrats, we embrace our diversity as a strength. We are the big tent party, big enough to include people of all faiths, of all spiritualities, and non-religious folks like me. We're not afraid of a changing religious landscape. We embrace it because we believe in pluralistic democracy. We, the Democratic Party, are the party of religious freedom. And don't you think it's time that we take those words back from the GOP? Absolutely. Again, love it. And again, I just want to stress, this was not at an atheist convention. This was at the Democratic National Committee's gathering where she is saying all this stuff. And I think this is a point that Democratic candidates need to make on the campaign trail, because if we care about protecting civil rights for LGBTQ people, preserving reproductive freedom for all, passing fact-based public policies, teaching comprehensive sex ed, saving the environment, promoting science, reading or making accessible, like challenging books and all that stuff. Only one party is fighting for that stuff. And I'm not saying that because I love everything the Democratic Party does. I'm saying that's your best option in a two-party democracy, right? It's not the Republican Party, which only ever seems to care about the desires of white evangelical Christians. Um, I hope one of the things that starts to happen, especially as we get to pivotal presidential election next year, and you know you have Senate big Senate races, and maybe the House can flip. Candidates who are running on the Democratic ticket need to stop taking us for granted. Um, just to give you some numbers here, 78% of atheists, just atheists, voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Only 14 supported Donald Trump. In 2020, Joe Biden got 72% of the nuns, the, the people with no religious affiliation, Trump got 26%. The thing is, even though most of us vote for Democrats, the big problem is that a lot of people with no religious affiliation don't vote at all. So that is a problem. If we voted with the same zeal as conservative Christians, then we would be a political force to be reckoned with. And I know, you know, trying to get atheists to do anything together, the saying goes, it's like herding cats. But for all the talk about like maybe what Trump is doing might push away some white evangelical voters, don't assume that's going to happen. It would be far more strategic for Democratic candidates to excite non-religious, non-voters who might get off their ass and support a candidate who doesn't take his or her cues from one religious demographic and who supports evidence-based policies and supports civil rights and religious freedom for everyone. Um, Sarah has been on the forefront of that argument. She told me this week that one of the people who heard her speech, a state legislator, came up to her and said, I'm paraphrasing, I'm a Christian and I've never heard anyone talk about the shared values between people of faith and secular people articulated that way before. And it really resonated with that lawmaker. Like, that's the sort of reception you would hope we could get in political circles. And it obviously helps to have someone like Sarah, who is smart and progressive, articulating those shared values. I mean, the fact that she was speaking up there, that is unprecedented, as one person told me. And she's just she's doing a fantastic job. And I appreciate that the Democratic Party wasn't afraid of letting her speak uh, on camera in front of all those people, too. Uh, but. It's also our job to make sure we are voting for candidates who support those values as well. I don't think every atheist, you know, by default has to be Democrat or anything like that. Again, I say that as someone who is very critical of a lot of things the Democrats do. But out of your two options, there's only one that gives a damn about what atheists value by and large, and it's not Republicans. So I'll leave it at that. That was an awesome speech. If you get a chance, go Google or go on YouTube search for Sarah Levin and find that speech. I'll leave a link. Uh, I'll leave a link here in the notes, but it's, it's definitely uh, worth watching. Uh, what other questions do we have here? I will get to that question in just a second. Uh, let me make sure this right here, here's the link for Sarah's 
speech. I'm um, leaving that in the comments there. Uh, what was that question, Den? It bothers me to no end that in God we trust is over the speaker's podium in the House of Representatives. Yeah, hey, I'm right there with you. Uh, here's the thing, though. If Democrats try to remove that, let's say they win the House back. Uh, they did this actually a couple of years ago when they were in the House and they were running committees. And when they have hearings and a witness has to take an oath before they, you know, speak to the committee, they have to say an oath that includes so help me God. When Democrats tried to say, you don't have to say that, of course, Republicans made a big deal about it. Democrats hate God, all these things. So the question then becomes, is trying to remove the phrase, so help me God, away from the podium, is that worth it? Is it worth trying to remove the phrase from any oath of office? Like, I'm sure most Democrats agree it shouldn't be there. But because, again, stupid politics, stupid media, if you try to get rid of it, even for totally sensible reasons, if MAGA cultists and religious right people are going to make a huge deal about it to the point where it backfires and hurts you, I don't know. At, at that point, it's a low priority, in, in my opinion, even though I don't think it should be there. What other thoughts, questions? It's definitely nice as an atheist to be acknowledged by politicians. Despite our growing numbers, it's strange that we are still ignored. I mean, part of the problem, you're right. Part of the problem is we don't have a leader. We don't even, like, sorry, Richard Dawkins doesn't even live here. You know what I mean? <laughs> we don't have one person who speaks for all of us. Whereas conservative Christians, I mean, you could point to a pastor. You could point to the head of some evangelical group or the Southern Baptist or whatever. So that's one thing. Like, who do you talk to if you want to talk to the king of all atheism? You know what I mean? So that's one problem. Also, where do you spread your message if you're trying to reach out to atheist voters? Like, where do you go to do that? There isn't one hub where we all get that information. Uh, so it's hard for them to do it, even if they wanted to. I think the way to overcome that is for them to just talk about general principles like church state separation, like not letting a religious group dictate public policy. I think you could just hammer those ideas over and over. Some candidates are doing that, um, even whether or not they bring up religion. Um, and by the way, there are plenty of Christian lawmakers who also bring all that stuff up. So kudos to them. Good for them for doing all that. But again, unless we are voting in big numbers, and I'm not just talking about atheists who are very politically active, but non-religious people who tend to be very wishy-washy in general. They can't even make up their mind on the God thing. Uh, so you got a bunch of like Gwyneth Paltrow clones who may not be religious, but they don't have a lot of strong, firm beliefs about anything. And trying to get them to vote, good luck with that. What else we got here? All right. I, okay. I'm going to show you a clip. It's going to infuriate you. And then we are going to talk about it. Let me give you a little bit of heads up about what we are looking at. There is a Christian ministry. It's basically two sisters. It's called Girl Defined. And basically, it's promoting purity culture. They've been doing that for years. The two sisters were promoting purity culture, which is harmful. And then they both got married, and now it's basically a sex is amazing, and sex when you're married is even better. That's all they talk about. But also, they're still promoting purity culture and abstinence-only everything. And anyway, I've talked about them for other reasons. Recently, one of the sisters, her name is Kristen Clark, she decided she was going to do a live interview or like a live-streamed interview with a guy named Patrick Flynn. He has doctor in front of his name, but I think he's a chiropractor, so it doesn't even count. But she was going to interview this dude who supposedly knows a lot about hormones and, and these types of issues. And I'm going to play uh, like a minute 30 second clip for you. It's several clips strung together. And I just want you to see what he says that is harmful, uh, how she pushes back or doesn't. And one thing I want you to know, I don't think I'm spreading any gossip here because she's spoken publicly about it, is that she had trouble conceiving a child. I think she adopted a child, but she had trouble conceiving and she's been public about that. And watch what this dude says about women 
and whether or not they can have babies. Okay, here's the clip, then we'll talk about it. It's, again, several clips uh, mashed into one. I just have this weird theory that God created women to have babies. If you got a uterus, you should be able to pop out kids like Skittles. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I, I need to learn how to do this. I'm, I've been trying, but it hasn't been working. Why have we been allowed these things that are birth control, which is just absolutely disgusting. Hmm. I, I can't understand the Christian community doesn't grasp on the, that birth control alters you both physically and mentally. And even how you view the world, even how you view a guy, that's why sometimes women, they get married and they're, they're, they're Christians who are on birth control. And all of a sudden they get off birth control and because they want to have a baby and look at the man and go, I don't love you anymore. Well, it, it's something hmm. wrong. There must be Satan in our world or something. No, you've been altered by an endocrine disruptor that now even how you view your spouse is extremely different. Here's what happens, but see, let's see if we take, sorry, but you brought yourself up. So I'm gonna bring it on this since uh, this okay. thing, you said it. <laughs> you want more sex than he does, but here's what happens this is, but you're also sick. Hmm. Do you Sam? See, women don't admit they're sick. If you have high estrogen, you're sick. It's not normal. Do you say it's gonna lead, and you don't have any fire yet, like a disease. So they say, well, we, you're, we'll wait till mm -hmm. you fall apart. Wait, there's no woman that's supposed to have a six pack. It's impossible, you're not a man. Hmm. Um, yeah. And the Christian community falls for this BS. Yeah, but they also fell for COVID too, so we won't even go in that direction. No. But that's a whole <laughs> we we won't go there on this episode. <laughs> yeah, so what are some topic. steps? Haha, <laughs> notice how she quickly tried to pivot away from that last one. Um, I see someone in the comments saying, like, never thought I could feel sorry for her, but don't. You know why? Because this guy is spreading objectively false information, and instead of calling him out on it, she just pivots or just lets it slide. Um, that first one where he's like, women, if you have a uterus, you should be popping out babies like Skittles or whatever he said there to a woman who has openly talked about her infertility problems. Like, oh my God, besides being insensitive and just cruel, that's not how it works. Like not every woman, not every person with the uterus can just pop out babies. You would know that if you've talked to, you know, more than a woman in your life. And especially one who has struggled with that. So that guy's that guy's brought on to dispense information. He lied about what birth control does as if that makes you hate your husband or something like that. Like there might be hormonal issues with birth control pills, no doubt. But it's different depending on who's taking it. Everyone has a different reaction to it. Hopefully you are talking to a quality doctor when you're taking it and uh, about any changes that you're going through. He also said women can't have six packs. I think later elsewhere in that conversation, he said like women shouldn't be competing in any sort of competitive sport. I mean, it's just bad information. Look, I don't mind having an online discussion with people you disagree with, especially if they're spreading misinformation. Like there's an argument to be made. You shouldn't give them a platform at all. But there is value to bringing on people you disagree with for like having a conversation about this stuff. What is not acceptable in my mind is bringing on someone like that who doesn't know this stuff, who spreads lies about this stuff as an endorsement, because that's what that was in her case. And then not calling out the stuff that he's saying that even she knows is wrong. She could speak to it from experience but she doesn't do that. She just lets it slide. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a purity culture. Maybe that's a conservative Christian upbringing thing. Like you respect your elders. You respect the people in authority. You respect a man if you're a woman. So she doesn't want to call him out on that stuff, but then don't bring him on in the first place. You could do two seconds of research and find out this guy's a quack, but she still brought him on. And again, their audience primarily, if I have it right, is a lot of younger Christian girls who look to those girls for advice and mentorship. And for them to be bringing on someone like that as some sort of qualified expert in things he clearly knows nothing about is really, really disturbing. And I think um, this video is on my channel, but a couple months ago, Kristen's sister, Bethany, had invited a, a sex therapist couple onto her show and that was disturbing for so many reasons. Um, I'll see, Dan, maybe you could find that link in my YouTube channel where it was Girl Defined talking, uh, Bethany is her name, talking to this couple. But that was even more disturbing because that couple knew even less about the subject than this guy knew about his. 
don't bring on these people to tell a, a uh, impressionable young Christian women how they should be thinking about this stuff. It's just, it's a disservice. And this guy is basically insulting her to her face and she doesn't want to address it. It's, oh my God, like they say and do a lot of things, that ministry, those sisters say a lot of things that make me mad. But that was a new level of, oh my God, I'm mad for you on your behalf. And I'm also mad that you thought young Christian girls needed to hear what this guy has to say because he's wrong and he's cruel about it. And what are you thinking? It's awful. What questions do we have for this while we are thinking about this? If While we are looking that up, I'm just going to get this. Uh, I promised you I would leave you with a lot of good news. I have one more happy story for you. And then maybe we'll cover a few crazy tweets and we'll be done with it. Um, while we are waiting, let me go ahead and just share with you the other piece of exciting news that I thought was pretty uh, interesting. Um, I got I got a tip that uh, if you look at the website for the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and if you don't remember, like the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, this is a group uh, that promotes uh, reason-based public policy church state separation they oppose discrimination against non-religious people they champion freedom of thought around the world in the US Congress right now and apparently if you look at the list check this out uh where did it go here we go um this is the list last we checked there were 18 members of this caucus they are all democrats but look at what's at the very bottom there's a guy named Robert Garcia who is a house member from California and the thing is, there was no announcement about this. Uh, no one said Garcia had joined the Free Thought Caucus, but there it is. There is his name on the caucus. And it's like, wait, they just got a 19th member? One, that's awesome. I love that the CFC is growing. I love that the Free Thought Caucus is growing. But if you're not familiar with Robert Garcia, you may, you may have heard about what he did earlier this year when he was sworn into office. Uh, because when he's a first-term congressman, and when he got elected, this is what he did. Check this out. Will be proudly sworn into Congress on the U.S. Constitution. Underneath the Constitution will be three items that mean a lot to me personally. A photo of my parents, who I lost to COVID, my citizenship certificate, and an original Superman number one from the Library of Congress. That's what he took his oath on when he was sworn into the House. And the reason he said he wanted Superman number one is he said one of the ways he learned how to read when he was a child was through comic books. And so they just meant a lot to him. And hey, if you're in Congress and you have access to the Library of Congress, there you go. So I saw that. But on paper, Robert Garcia is listed as a Catholic. So I, I didn't know anything about his religious affiliation. And now he is a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Just to give you, if you're not familiar, I know I've said this in other videos, um, all of those 19 members, only one of them, the founder, one of the co-founders of the caucus, Jared Huffman, also from California, he's the only openly humanist member of that group. Everyone else is has a religious label, uh, according to the Pew Research Center. Uh, they're Catholic, there's uh, a Hindu, there's, there's a Buddhist in the list. It doesn't matter because they're all committed to church state separation and all of that. So I don't care after that. Right. To be clear, this is not an atheist club, as like right wing critics have suggested. It's just a group of lawmakers who care about these issues. There's no reason more Congress members shouldn't be in this caucus because there's nothing anti-religious about it. But I love that it's to the point where not only is the Congressional Free Thought Caucus growing, Every time it grows, I almost don't hear anything about it. Like Breitbart people don't write about it. Fox News doesn't care, which is kind of disappointing. Like I wish they would make a big deal about it. Maybe more people would join. But also, isn't that progress in a way that it's like, oh, you joined the Congressional Free Thought Caucus? Whatever. Don't care. There's other things we're going to like spread lies about. So that's kind of cool that it flies under the radar. And it's not hurting these candidates. All of these people are, I think, running for re-election 
and none of them are worried that their affiliation with this caucus is going to hurt them on the campaign trail. Otherwise, I imagine they would not have joined. Now, the question is, what is this caucus going to do? It has 19 members. What power does it have? Not much. Not yet. But you can imagine that as the caucus grows, and if Democrats are in the majority, then maybe if there is a bill that affects church-state separation that has to do with religion, that's when they would flex their muscle. But it doesn't bother me that they haven't been able to do that yet, because right now it's just let it grow, let them gather, let them not be afraid of it, let them show everyone that there's nothing to be worried about. Meanwhile, there is a congressional prayer caucus, which is friggin' huge, and they captured pretty much every Republican. Uh, so I, I just love the fact that Garcia is a member, a guy who took his oath of office on Superman. That's fantastic. Uh, may there be more people. Listen, if you're retiring from Congress in the near future, even if you're a Republican who's like, to hell with it, now's the time to jump on board. That would be awesome. What other questions we got? Then we'll just cover some crazy tweets. These Christians learned about sex in the worst possible way. Yeah, I think that's the video uh, that I was showing you from uh, Bethany. The link is in, in the comments. But that was Kristen's sister who interviewed a different couple. And the misinformation that was spread and the, oh my God, what did they just say? Nature of that conversation blew my mind. It was, it was messed up. Uh, what other questions we got here? Any thoughts? Leave your super likes. You know the drill. <sighs> LOL. I see this one. I'm I'm posting this anyway. People retire from Congress. I thought you had to die before they finally kicked you out. Uh, only true for Mitch McConnell. No one else. Diane Feinstein, too. All right. Let's talk about Greg Locke, unfortunately. Um, because... He, listen, he says a lot of crazy stuff from his uh, tent, circus tent church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. But there was a clip of him this week that where he said something during a sermon, and it was so disturbing that I think even a lot of Christians got mad about it. This was flagged by a, a Twitter user, Dark Elf Zombie One. But I'm going to play you this clip, and uh, we'll talk about it on the other side. Uh, Wait till you hear what Greg Locke is saying about people with handicaps. Not this way for the most part overseas, but churches in the American culture. You know, one of the largest expenses we have in buildings, the amount of handicap parking and handicap accessibility that we have in our churches. Now, let me make you mad for a minute. And I don't really care. Why is it you pull up to a church that says they operate in faith and you have 50 handicapped parking spots? Ain't nobody laid hands on them handicapped folks yet. I don't care what Twitter says. You can get mad all you want to. Fold your arms, stick your lips out, pooch them out. I don't care. I'm so unafraid of what anybody in this tent thinks about me right now in my life. I could care less. We, we just expect that people are going to leave church the same way they came to church. Well, we ought to start having some signs out there that don't have, you know, like, like handicap accessibility, people in a wheelchair. We ought to start having signs of a wheelchair laying down and somebody just walking up. Well, Pastor, I think you're being insensitive. I think you just don't have any faith is what I think. So if I'm interpreting that correctly, if you have any sort of physical disability, it's your fault for not having enough faith in God. Because, you know, if you believe God can do anything and fix everything and you need and you're not healed, he's basically blaming the victim in that sense. And obviously, you know, there are plenty of people with physical disabilities who have so much faith that they sometimes go to faith healers who pretend to cure you and they don't, or they go to Locke's church because they're hoping for a miracle. But guess what? Sometimes those types of miracles cannot happen. It doesn't happen. Like the only chance you have in certain cases is maybe a doctor has something you can do. But by and large, like 
if you're in a, if I'm not going to cherry pick certain disabilities, but his argument that if you're in a wheelchair, that you're not faithful, you're not fully devout is so disturbing. It's got to be super offensive to people who are Christian. Uh, and I think a lot of them spoke out against him too for saying that, because obviously that's not true. Uh, and it's deeply damaging. And check out what he responded with later. Uh, it's an unbelievable shame and disgrace. The things that have been said to me and about me today, simply because I said yesterday that people with handicapped conditions can be healed and the church in America should believe for and expect miracles. Wow. The evil comments and messages from people steaming mad that I have biblical faith is utterly ridiculous. Hashtag where's my chair. I don't know what that's in reference to. That's a weird one. Um, by the way, he did not say handicapped people can be healed. He said that if they're not healed, it's because they don't have sufficient faith. As if it's their fault, they have some sort of physical disability. So again, he's, I don't know if you want to call it gaslighting or just flat out lying, but what he said was deeply offensive. I don't expect anyone who goes to that church to call him out on it. But man, for a guy who lives on social media, Greg Locke, like that's the sort of thing that deserves to be called out by other pastors and other Christians. I mean, hell, you can use the God does everything for a reason and say that's why some people have disabilities. But he, and that's a lie I'm sure they can get away with. But where's the bigger Christian pushback to that sort of lie? Because again, just like the girl defined dude, uh, this isn't just a religious lie. This is just flat out harmful. And the fact that someone like Locke is saying this, and of course he says everything with total conviction, 100% confidence, completely unearned, but that's the way he talks. It's so, it's, it's so offensive to me and I already don't like the guy, but that's super disturbing. Can't hear him. His shirt's too loud. Uh, then you're very lucky, my friend, because not hearing Greg Locke means you have won the life lottery. Oh, no. How dare disabled people demand accessibility to public buildings? Seriously. Seriously. Who gets mad about having accessibility in buildings or handicapped spots in a parking lot? Like, imagine the sort of person you have to be to complain that you have to do that. Because, of course, the implication is if the law didn't make you, of course you would never do that because you don't give a shit about those people. Oh, that guy is so bad. Facts. If faith healing was working, why are those people not in hospitals? Yes, right on. You will never see Benny Hinn or Locke or any of those people who claim to work miracles and they're prophets of God. They're never putting their hands on the forehead of babies in cancer wards. They will never go there because they know deep down none of their stuff actually works. It's all a performance every single time. Why is he even making a statement? I thought he claimed he didn't care what people had to say. Yeah, the fact that Greg Locke responded to the criticism shows you this was getting to him probably from people he normally respects and that when even Christians are getting at him for saying stupid stuff, that's usually when he feels like he has to respond. And then, of course, he doesn't apologize for it. He just says, no, it's your fault. You misinterpreted what I was saying, even though it's on live stream and it's on video and everyone heard exactly what I said. He's not good at his job. I have a mental disability rather than a physical one. I'm on the autism spectrum. Do I just not have enough faith to magically become neurotypical? Hey, Greg Locke has also said, if you have autism, uh, that's demonic. Uh, it's the demon's fault. And again, that goes back to you are not sufficiently invested in Jesus. If you had better faith, Greg Locke has said you would not have autism, which again, that was, I think he said that last year or maybe a year before Christians got at him for that as well. Because of course, one, people with autism, I think the parents almost universally would say there's nothing wrong with my kid. There's no disorder that needs to be fixed. That is what makes my child special. But also this argument that there's something wrong with your kid uh, faithfully. 
that they're not sufficiently devout. That was offensive to them too, because they're like, no, my kid is autistic and my kid believes in God uh, the right way or whatever. So that was the, I, yeah, Greg Glock's got in trouble for saying this stuff before too. He doesn't care because that's how cult leaders work. All right, I'm going to go to a few last tweets and then we'll uh, call it a night because I can't not talk about crazy stuff that the transformed wife has said recently. Uh, I figured, let me start with uh, this one that she tweeted. Uh, again, this is one of your abstinence, purity culture type of grandmas. Governor Newsom is forcing Christian schools to accept biological males into women's sports or they will be kicked out of, I can't remember what CIF stands for. Some Christian schools will now drop athletics completely. My children were in a small Christian high school and my sons played baseball and basketball all the way through. It was one of their fondest memories in high school. It was one of ours too. One of my sons even went to the state championships in basketball and played in the big Arco Stadium in Sacramento. Sports was good for them and they learned many valuable lessons. This will destroy athletics as we know them. It's heartbreaking. Listen, I don't know what Gavin Newsom did in California regarding this particular law. I think the idea is if they're participating in a state-sponsored uh, postseason playoff run, something like that, then you know you have to accept trans students on the team under whatever conditions the, the league decides to put there. And if some Christian schools decide they're not going to play at all, that's on them. I don't know why she's blaming the state for that. Uh, I don't know why Christian schools feel the obligation to participate in a state-run event. I thought the whole point of private schools was that you don't have to do that. But I know why they do it. They do it because all the competition is taking place in the public schools. And if they just stuck to their Christian leagues, it wouldn't be fun. But here's the thing. If the argument she's making in, in the first paragraph here is that he's allowing trans students to play high school sports, Gavin Newsom is, if he's allowing trans students to play high school sports, she's very upset about this. But then look at what she says in the next paragraph. Like, my kids played sports, and it was a great memory for them. It was the parents' memory, too. My son got to play at the state championships, and it, they learned valuable lessons. Those are the arguments for why we should allow trans kids to play sports in high school. Because it's really not about who wins and who loses. It's about the experience. They're not professionals. They just want to play the damn game. So everything she is saying in that middle paragraph, she's making a case for why trans people should be able to play sports because of all those memories. Because guess what? Winning isn't the only thing that matters at that level for sure. And then she's mad because that's exactly what the governor is doing. And she doesn't like it because, I don't know, trans cooties or something. That's what she's worried about. Who knows? Um <laughs> One person points out here, I'm going to show this, Dan. Is the transformed wife actually paying for access to long tweets? The answer is, I believe so, yeah. She is paying Elon for the ability to write these glorious essays for her fan. Let me get to the next uh, long tweet by her. This one is much more offensive. What to do about a husband who is verbally abusive? Every time he says something cruel to you, Put up your shield of faith in front of you and ping. <laughs> Again, I, I can't even say it with a straight face. Ping those cruel comments straight up to the Lord. Like, like that. Just deflect the cruelty away. Don't allow him to steal your joy. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Remember that a soft answer turns away wrath. Yeah, uh-huh. Find a godly older woman who you can meet with on a regular basis to encourage you and give you wisdom. You can do all things through Jesus, yada, yada, yada. What else, what else, what else? This is a spiritual battle. Listen, if you have an abusive spouse and the answer you are getting is just, just do this and, and deflect the bad things they say to you to God, one, I feel like that would be mean to God, but also that's not how... What do you actually do in the moment? What, you take the abuse? That's horrible advice. What if it's physical abuse? Because you know her advice is not any different 
when it comes to physical abuse. Um, and this is the problem with this fundamentalist Christian mindset that says, listen, once you're married, you're joined for life. Nothing can stop that from happening, which is basically an, you know, it, it allows abuse to thrive because those guys, usually guys, know that the women can't leave. So the abuse, you know, it, it fest, uh, festers up in that world. It's really disturbing. If your answer is that a soft answer turns away wrath, sorry, that is not how abuse is resolved. You need a therapist or you need a divorce if you can't settle these issues. But this idea that, oh, what do you do about a husband who's verbally abusive? Her answer is take it, deal with it. That is horrible, harmful advice, really disturbing advice. Um, let me go to one more from her. Then I swear I'm done with her. Uh, oh, yes. Along the same lines here. Young women only have sex with a godly man who has committed his life to you after he has said, I do. This is the only safe place to have sex and babies. It's God's perfect plan for you. Like, I disagree with the wait to have sex until after marriage thing. I think that's just bad advice, but that's an opinion. I don't really care if she says you should wait until after marriage to have sex. Okay, fine. But the next line, this is the only safe place to have sex. One, no, it is possible to be safe with someone, you know, you love or you're comfortable with before marriage. And also going back to the last tweet, as she just pointed out, it is very possible that in a marriage, it's not safe. Because not everything that occurs during marriage is going to work out perfectly. So this idea that if you just get married to a Christian and you don't have sex until after marriage, um, if you do all those things, then everything will always be fine is just flat out untrue. And if she ever spoke to women outside her Christian bubble, maybe she would know that, but she never does. Like, again, this goes back to the girl defined bad advice thing, too, because this is the same garbage that they tell their young audience. And it's deeply, deeply harmful because it tells women that as long as you do part one, part two is guaranteed to follow. And when that doesn't happen in practice, a lot of those women think I did something wrong. I must have failed him. And not that. No, maybe the other person is the problem here. Maybe this type of sex is not safe. Maybe it is abusive in some way. So again, this is uh, so messed up. Uh, I got one more tweet. It's not from her. It's just a really weird thing. This is from a pastor. Last thing we're going to talk about here. This is from a pastor, Nate Schloman. Just, in, just read this and enjoy this with me. I truly do feel bad for any Christian man who doesn't have other Christian men in their life to call them gay from time to time when appropriate. Seek out brotherhood. It sustains you during tough times and keeps you grounded in good times. Hey, fellas, do you have someone in your life who calls you a homosexual from time to time because you need a friend like that? Like, what the hell is up with this dude's friends? And they think male bonding is when someone else says, dude, you're acting gay. This is the level of maturity he's at, which I think is like third grade potty humor at this point. Very strange. And also, hey, there's your Christian advice column for the week. Girl defined, transformed wife, and that weird pastor who thinks getting called gay is a sign of progress or something like that, if your buddies do it in a slur sort of way. Have a good weekend, everyone. What other questions? And then I'll call it a night. Oh, there's some weird stuff going on. Trans kids in sports are a tiny minority, but all those bigots seem to know one. I don't know if I agree with that. Do they know one? Or do they just think they have a they they have a friend of a friend who knows a trans person? By the way, it's the same kid who wants kitty litter in the classroom because they they think they're a cat. <coughs> Like, it's, it's all a hoax. They never know anybody. And the thing is, what they will pass entire laws in some states to go after, like, one swimmer 
in the high school world who was going to be like a fifth place swimmer at a meet with seven kids or something. They're like they'll do anything to use Jesus to hurt a couple of kids because that's what makes them happy when they're conservative Christians. Uh, excusing spousal abuse. Why am I not surprised? Yeah, that's conservative Christianity for you as well. I mean, they also excuse child abuse in the name of training up a child or, you know, pastor, priest, penitence, privilege, or whatever. Like, they will always look the other way when it comes to abuse, and then they'll make up some religious reason for why they're able to do it, and it's totally fine. Um, it's really disturbing stuff. Do you want poll results? I am curious about, the, is this about me versus Zod? I would love to know what the results are. Then what do we got? Did I win? Did I win? I better, oh, we had two polls. Okay. Tell me how I did. I don't even know what the other question was. Let's see. First was climate change. Okay. And what do we have from there? Then I'm assuming you're going to pop this up. So I don't, yep, drum roll. And by the way, while he's doing this, if anyone has any other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, bring them in. It's the last time. Um, oh, 100% of people, let's see. 100% of people think it's an important voting issue. Well, that's good. I would hope if you're watching this. That is something you feel about climate change. We're very bad at polls, though. I feel like anytime you get 100% of anything, that can't possibly be a good poll. And what's... Come on. Did I beat Zod? That's all that matters. This is the only poll result I want to see. Someone go tell him that I'm going to beat him. How'd I do? How'd I do? Oh! What? There was a tie... No, no, boo, we'll have a rematch soon. Um, I will plug, uh, let me get the link here for you. Here is, ha, here is the Twitch channel, uh, if anyone is interested. I don't know how we tied, but congrats, Zod. Um, there we go. Here's the link for anyone interested in the Twitch live streams. It's this for now, because I don't do video games, because I think I pretty much stopped after Mario 1 on NES. Uh, that's not disrespectful to people who play games. I, I'm, It's just not my thing. So uh, it's all good. Um, in that case, thank you all for sticking around. I should next Friday at a normal time. I appreciate it. Please like and subscribe and Patreon. I'll put up the banner in case you need to see it. There it is. Uh, Den, thank you so much for helping out with everything. And thank you all for watching. And I will see you next week. Have a good one, everybody.